Hello, this is a video on doing what we might call a detailed observation or a train of thought of, of a passage. And I'm going to use Matthew chapter 5 verses 43 through 48 as our test case. I have the New American Standard Bible up here. I'm using Bible Gateway um, to get the, uh, the basic text up here. And so um, I chose the New American Standard Bible because it's a fairly wooden translation, formal equivalence translation. NIV would be fine. New American, uh, New Revised Standard would be would be fine. Uh, English Standard Version would be okay. Um, uh, Holman Christian Standard. Those those are all tend to be formal equivalence translations. New King James would be okay, uh, although the King James tradition gets us into other issues I won't go into. But um, so you might read this a few times, just get a feel for it. You've heard that it was said, "You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy." But I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you so that you may prove yourself to be sons of your fathers in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good, he, the, or the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Even the tax collectors do that. And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Even the Gentiles do the same. By the way, with the, uh, with the New American Standard Bible, if it's in italics, that's where the uh, New American Standard has added words to try to get bring out the sense. They're not technically there in the Greek, but the, the New American Standard is, is indicating that that's the implied meaning of it. Um, even the Gentiles do the same. Therefore, be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. Okay, so the, the first thing I'm going to do uh, is after, you know, praying and uh, say, Lord, open my mind uh, and reading through several times, three times maybe, um, you know, and now I'm going to print this off. I'm going to print these verses off, uh, and I'm going to begin to do some observing. So hold that thought. I'm going to print it off. Okay, so what I did is I um, printed off these verses from Matthew 5, and I blew it up to 150% because I like blowing up things. I was a chemistry major once upon a time. And so here, here is this. And now we can see the text, and because I have old eyes, um, this is nice. It's big. I like it. I'm headed for that, you know, large print Bible one day. So the first, remember the different thing. What are the different things that we look for uh, when we're going through uh, a biblical text? Well, the first thing that we look for are key terms. What are some key terms? And by key terms, I don't mean like and. And is not a key a key term. Um, but we want to look for, and by the way, if you could do this in Greek, that would be ideal. But again, we're just starting off here. Um, so I'm going to highlight, I got a nice little highlighter here. I'm going to highlight what I think to be key terms. You have heard it was said, uh, you will love your neighbor and hate your enemy. I think neighbor, love is a key. I think love might be a key word here. I think maybe neighbor could be a key word here. Um, enemy, I think, could be a key term here. And again, we're pretend that you've never seen this. You've never seen a Bible before. We're trying to be objective. We're, we're an alien. We've come from the planet Venus. Um, so love, neighbor, enemy, those all seem to be key terms here. But I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Um, I, enemy and love is again there. Um, pray could be one. Uh, although it seems like, I'm going to go ahead I'm going to go ahead and highlight pray, even though, uh, oh, hold on, I've hit a bunch of things accidentally. Uh, even though um, we probably, you probably feel like you know what the word pray does. I'm going to go ahead and highlight it. Persecute, we could do that. Prove, that's interesting. This is, of course, the New American Standard Bible. Uh, prove might be, I might want to look at some other versions. Maybe, maybe, maybe other versions don't say prove. Sons. Uh, I kind of feel like I know what those mean. Uh, what are the evil and the good? That's interesting. What are, who are the righteous and the unrighteous? Those could be interesting. And what I might do is, come on, I might do a word study on these when we get to week number three. Okay, my laptop's not collaborating with me. Unrighteous. All right, you kind of get a feel for it. Let me go ahead and do the others and not waste your time. Okay, I didn't do a whole lot more. I figured tax collectors, what's a tax collector? That might be that might be useful information. Uh, Gentiles, okay, maybe I should do that because I shouldn't assume that you know what it is. You know, we're from Mars. We don't know what a Gentile is. 
it seems to me that perfect is an important word. Now, again, you can highlight every word, but I've tried to highlight what are some key terms uh, that might be of interest if I really wanted to understand this passage. That was the first thing to look for, key terms, okay? Now, the second thing we look for are key grammatical features. I think I'm gonna come back to that because that's the one that's hardest for us to do uh, when we're just starting out. That requires a little knowledge of grammar. And in general, uh, we don't tend to be, people don't tend to be as strong in that area, even in English. So let me, let me hold off on that and go to the third one. And that is connecting words. And I see, I see but here, that's an important connecting word that implies contrast. Third thing we look for are uh, thought relationships. Contrast is a thought relationship. So we get two for one. The, we have both an explicit word that tells us about that and also the thought relationship of contrast. I actually, I actually think I would prefer to translate uh, this as a but here as well. You will love your enemy, but hate your enemy. I mean, love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. So that could be translated differently. Uh, but I say to you, um, so that... Uh, there's there's an expression implying result with the result that um, for explanation or substantiation uh, connecting word uh, for explanation substantiation uh, there's a comparison here with tax collectors again I'm kind of blurring together con connecting words and thought relationships because that's what connecting words do connecting words bring out explicitly the implicit uh, thought relationship between things. C comparison to the Gentiles. Therefore, when you see it, therefore, ask what it's there for. Okay, so I'm going to print this off and I'm going to get a pen and I'm going to uh, show you what I might do if I circled uh, connecting words. So I'll be right back. Maybe. So here I've decided to circle the key connecting words, but so that for, for, if, therefore, I might have missed one. I'm not sure uh, you might, but I, I think that's most of them. I, who is a connecting word, but it's not, an, not necessarily an important one. So um, if I were doing the, um, the write-up on this, and I'm gonna talk about writing it up in a second, um, I would ask questions about, about these. So for example, uh, the connecting word is not as important as the meaning that the connecting word implies, the, the thought relationship. So I mentioned that but implies a contrast. So I would ask a question, well, what is contrasting here? So that implies a result. What, why does this result in this? And I'll talk about the, some of the questions we might ask about this text later on in the video. Uh, four, um, is it uh, it's substantiating this? Um, so how does it substantiate it? Um, it expands upon it. If you only love those, what reward do you have? So how does it expand on it? This is if implies a condition, um, therefore implies causation, logical causation, therefore. So again, we are observing things about this. So the first thing to observe are key terms, grammatical items, which I'm coming back to, uh, connecting words. The fourth one is thought relationships. And I've already suggested that these connecting words imply thought relationships, but there, there can sometimes be thought relationships even beyond um, uh, the, the connecting words. So I'm gonna, now I'm gonna write, I'm just gonna write some notes to myself on this that relate to the thought relationships in the passage and I'll be right back, maybe. Okay, so I've used some obnoxious uh, marker uh, to make it, make it clear and, and visible. Um, so let's look at, at some of the, again, like I said, some of the um, relationships between thoughts will be connected to connecting words and some of them will be implicit. So you've heard it said, you will love your neighbor and hate your enemy. I believe there's a contrast between loving your neighbor and hating your enemy. I think but would have been a better translation of the sense here. But there's a, so there's a contrast, I would say between loving your neighbor and, and hating your enemy. But, I've already said, implies a contrast. Uh, what Jesus said is different from what they've heard. Um, they've heard this, but I say to you. 
So this we're going to ex expect this to uh, uh, be different from the other. And I think the key way that it's different is that while while the what they've heard, and we want to ask, well, who who are they? <laughs> um, but what they've heard implies a contrast between neighbor and enemy. But Jesus wants a comparison, and I probably should have put comparison here um, because. Uh, it's not just loving your neighbor, but it's loving your enemies as well. I've also mentioned that so that implies result. The result, uh, the result of, of both loving your enemies and your neighbors is that you demonstrate that you're sons of your father who is in heaven. And actually this is, a, I may, I, perhaps I should have asked what sons of your father in heaven means as well as a key term as well, children. Of your father in heaven for and this is an explanation of what what is just said he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous so there's a comparison between how god uh, in other words a similarity between how god treats the evil and how god treats the good how god treats the righteous and how god treats the unrighteous there's a similarity in how god does it there's a comparison which is a relationship. And by the way, if you want an overarching list of these relationships, you can find it both in my little book, Making Sense of God's Word, um, in, in a video I've also done on following a train of thought. Uh, and also, uh, uh, there, if you're taking this as part of a class, I have a, uh, it's, not, it's not a completed book, but I have a book uh, that um, has a chapter that I've given you access to if you're in my class. Uh, that goes into more detail on these relationships between potential relationships between thoughts. So this comparison between the evil and the good, the righteous, the unrighteous here. For, again, more explanation, if you only love those who love you, what reward do you have? Even tax collectors do the same. Even the Gentiles do the same. So uh, if we go down here, there's a comparison, comparisons between uh, Christians and tax collectors, between Christians and Gentiles. There's an argument from lesser to greater here. If, if even the tax collectors and Gentiles have that level of, of, um, of loving, you know, shouldn't you, as a person of God, have an even higher level of loving than they do? But you're the same as them if you're only loving your neighbors. So comparison is an uh, uh, item there. All right. So... Um, comparison. And then we have, of course, a condition, uh, which I, I did not mention, should have mentioned. Uh, I also have identified a new relationship uh, uh, connecting words that I didn't, and that's a comparison here um, of us being like our Heavenly Father. Uh, and then therefore implies a laws, logical causation, if this, then, then that, therefore that. So I hope uh, you're getting a sense here of some of the logical relationships that we can observe, that they're implicit in thought. Sometimes connecting words bring them explicitly out, but they can be there even implicitly without a connecting word. Okay, so we have looked at key terms. We have looked at connecting words. We have looked at uh, thought relationships in general. Um, the, the fourth thing to look for that we talked about were things like tone, uh, things like um, uh, historical allusions, uh, things like literary allusions, like intertextuality, or back to the Old Testament, perhaps, um, matters of uh, point of view, uh, matters of uh, uh, point of view would be kind of the perspective uh, that's, that's there. Um, I don't see any literary allusions here to the Old Testament. Um, then, then also literal, non-literal was another, another one. So is there non-literal language here? I'm not seeing any. Uh, uh, I mean, you might argue that being children of God, we're not literally children, but I, I don't think that is worth exploring. Um, tone, is there a tone here? I don't know that there's a, there's not a heavy tone of shaming, 
but there might be just a teeny bit of shame. It's like, well, you're no better than a tax collector or a Gentile. If you don't love your enemy, you're no better than the people that you don't think are particularly great. <laughs> so there, there might be a little bit of tone in terms of shaming here. Um, and I should note that. Um, let's see, in terms of point of view, uh, it's Jesus's point of view. Uh, that's, that's clear. No allusion to the Old Testament. A historical allusion, not really historical, but there are agricultural images here, which is interesting, suggests that Jesus lives in a kind of farming uh, kind of, of context. So let me go ahead and write that up, and I'll, sh I'll show you that. The document gets cluttered, unfortunately, as we move along. Okay, so I've written those up. I wrote that it's Jesus' point of view. I decided to do boxes, agricultural imagery, and then down here I've put, there's a little bit of shaming with these comparisons to tax collectors and Gentiles. All right, so that, that leaves us with, uh, the, I skipped number two, grammatical kinds of features. And these are harder to get at. Um, I may have mentioned interlinearbible.org as a way to get a peek into the Greek. So for example, the you here is a plural you. It's not a singular you. That's a grammatical feature. We, we have a tendency I think is Western individualist to see uh, the you of the Bible as me, but it's us usually. So that's a grammatical feature uh, there. Um, let, me, let me look here and see if I see some other grammatical features that might be of interest for us to note. Okay, so since that other sheet was getting so cluttered, I decided to do my grammar run through on a new, on a new sheet. So you can see I've, I've noted a number of grammatical things and uh, to be frank, uh, because the English isn't always clear in, in what's going on, I went to uh, the Greek uh, to uh, get a better sense of what I'm actually looking at. And again, um, I, Greek and Hebrew aren't really emphasized in ministerial training these days, but I mean, I, I'm going to be honest with you, you simply cannot be an authority on scripture in terms of its original meaning without knowing Greek and Hebrew. You, you can't. Um, uh, you can do great. God uses us, you know, absolutely. Our, our Greek, and in fact, you probably will do better than most Greek scholars at um, communicating the gospel. So, uh, you know, if you have to make a choice between being a good communicator of the gospel, you know, and knowing the language is probably, there's the priority is to, to, to have a, a broader sense of the word. But you cannot be an expert. You just can't on the Bible if you don't know Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic. So uh, I want to show you Interlinear Bible just for a second here. Again, in, in a perfect world, you'd learn the language and not have to use a, a cheat like this. Um, but I do want you to know that um, interlinearbible.org, uh, which redirects to biblehub.com backslash uh, interlinear, uh, or I guess that's a forward slash. But anyway, um, for example, you have heard that 2P says, tells me it's a second plural, it's a y'all. So you can, you can get a lot of information. This is definitely better than not knowing anything uh, about the original. So I, I do wanna mention interlinearbible.org as a place where you might go to try to come up with some of these grammatical uh, observations. So my first observation is that the U is a plural. It's a y'all, y'all have heard, which I mentioned. And then notice I've, I've looked at the tenses. You heard past tense, but I say present tense. Uh, other tenses here, who are persecuting you would be a possible way to translate it, although it's, it's not entirely clear, uh, but you, you could be translated are persecuting. Uh, present tense doesn't always mean something going on right now. And again, you have to learn the nuances of these things, uh, but um, present tense there. Um, so tense is something that you can observe. Uh, mode or mood, is it a statement? Is it a question? Is it a command? So there are commands here. Love, you will love is a command. It's a, it's a future tense, but it's a future tense used to make a command. Same thing down here. You will, you will, be, you will clean up your work room. You will pick up your clothes. You understand the future tense can imply a command. So we have a command here. You will be perfect. You will love. Um, and then love and pray here are straight out imperatives in, in Greek. Um, so uh, interesting, I, I discovered, and I don't know why the NASB, I'm a little disappointed, frankly, that the NASB did this, 
Prove is not what the Greek says here. The Greek is become, so that you might become sons of your father. The implication being that you, you are not sons, you are not children of God if you don't love your enemies as well. Interesting. Uh, but for whatever reason, the, NI, the uh, NASB has put in prove yourself, so that you may prove yourselves to be sons of your father who is in heaven. Um, who is a connecting word? I could have mentioned it when we did the connecting sweep, um, but I, I, I decided, okay, I'll go ahead and, and note this here, that we're talking about our heavenly father, not our earthly. We have earthly fathers, but this, which father are we talking about here? We're talking about our father who is in heaven. That's a relative clause telling us which father we have uh, in mind here. Uh, interesting interpretation that the NASB. So um, one of the features of Greek grammar is called voice. And these are both active voice. Um, one of the possible nuances of the active voice is a causative active. And the NASB, I think correctly here, has inferred uh, that it's God causing um, the sun to rise and he's causing it uh, to rain. Don't overread it. It's not a theological statement. It's a, it's a, it's a, a way of talking. So don't, people, people always over, or not always, people often overread uh, uh, grammar. Um, it's, but it's a causative active. Uh, the Greek is simply, he rises his sun and he rains on, you know, but I think causes his sun and sends rain is, is better English. But I just note that there's an inference in, in there. It's not, and, and there's nothing wrong with the translation doing this. If it's a good translation, it will definitely try uh, to bring out what the nuance is. But all translation is interpretation, as B and Stuart tell you. Uh, the if here, there are two words for if in Greek. This is the if if. Again, it's not a big deal. It just says that this is a true condition. It's not a what if. It's a, it's a uh, real world if. If you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Number of rhetorical questions here. A rhetorical question is a question where I'm not really asking you a question. I'm making a statement by using a question. Um, if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? None. Do they not do the same? Yes. If you only, are, are you doing any more than others? No, you're not. Um, do they do not do the same? Yes, they do. So these are rhetorical questions. I already mentioned that you will be perfect is, an, is a command here. It's not, it is an expectation, I would say. Now, I forgot to mention something very important when we did thought relations. When we did the thought relationship sweep, I forgot to mention that this therefore verse here is a generalization. It, it steps back and it says, given all this, here's the bottom line. Be perfect like your heavenly father is perfect. Now, I'm going to probably return to this when we do word studies. I think probably it would be better translated as you will be complete as your heavenly father is complete. Because your heavenly father, um, he doesn't go halfway and just love his neighbors. He goes the full way and loves his enemies too. He doesn't just send rain on uh, good people but he gives rain to bad farmers too. He gives sun uh, to bad farmers too. For a long time, I misunderstood this because rain, rain, go away, please come back another day. I always thought of rain as bad. And so I thought this was saying that God allows bad things to happen to good people. No, exactly the opposite. I was, I was unaware that I was unaware, unaware, unaware that I was unreflective. That rain is good in an agricultural world. And God sends rain, not just on the good farmers, but on the bad farmers too. Okay, so here we, here we finish uh, phase one of a detailed observation, phase one of following a train of thought. We have observed a bunch of stuff. Uh, we have observed uh, key words and phrases. We've observed grammatical features. We've observed connecting words. We've observed thought relationships. And we've observed miscellaneous features like tone and point of view and, and so forth. So now it's time for us to write it up. What we're gonna write up is a, a, what I call a train of thought assignment. We're gonna write a little commentary uh, on this and I'm gonna do it as I do this video. Um, I'm gonna write it as we go. So let's now uh, work on writing up, having made our observations, we have our rough draft, our sketch, our, our data, our raw data. Let's write it up into a train of thought assignment. Before I do that, I wanna, I wanna mention this, um, this template uh, that I uh, have 
uh, sent to the class. Uh, and this is kind of um, how I'm going to, you, you can write it up this way if you want. You don't have to do it in a, a, a paragraph form uh, as I'm going to do it. You could, you could use this as kind of a middle step where you write it all out uh, before you write it up. Um, and who knows, maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll just use this form rather than writing it, writing it up. Um, but we're gonna, we're gonna use this, this to, to capture the observations that we've made. A crucial next step is we're gonna ask questions about these. Again, we're pretending like we don't know, we don't know anything. And so we're going to, we're going to um, raise questions that we will then pick up later as we uh, move into more full-blown interpretation. Where we're gonna start is we're gonna start with the broader and immediate literary context of what we're looking at. Literary context are the words that come before and after the passage we're looking at. So if Matthew 5, uh, 43 to 48 is our paragraph we're looking at uh, for this assignment, then the immediate literary context is the rest of chapter five. And then the broader literary context is the rest of Matthew. Now the rest of the Bible is not the literary context of Matthew because remember, these books circulated originally on their own scrolls. Mark was not part of Matthew originally. Genesis was not part of Matthew originally. This is a paradigm shift moment. Genesis is part of the historical context of Matthew, not the literary context. Why? Because Genesis was not in the same book as Matthew when Matthew was written. When Matthew was written, it was on its own scroll. So the literary context of, of Matthew is the rest of Matthew. The Old Testament is part of the historical context of Matthew. Um, now, the rest of the New Testament, only the parts of the New Testament that Matthew knew are part of the historical context of Matthew. So Mark, because most scholars think that Matthew used Mark as a source, Mark is part of the historical context of the Gospel of Matthew. If you understand what I'm saying, you're beginning to know how to read the Bible in context. These are paradigm shifts because we, we usually don't grow up uh, trained to read the Bible for what it actually meant uh, in context. It's just not how we're trained. We read, we, 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 we're trained to read it as a magical book, and it is, but, but it also had a meaning. And in order to know its meaning, we have to pay attention to context. So hold that thought. I'm going to begin to fill out this worksheet uh, as, I, as I'm working towards um, following the train of thought of Matthew 5, 43 to 48 uh, in detail observing details and doing a detailed observation. So I did a little write up of the, what we call the broader, broader literary context. That's the rest of Matthew. By the way, if I was doing the whole thing in paragraph form, I would still start in, in much this way. Now, um, basically here's what I wrote. The rest of the gospel of Matthew is the broader literary context of Matthew 5, 43 to 48. Now a key passage in the rest of Matthew which is, I think, important literary context uh, for this chapter is Matthew 22, 34 to 40. This is the scene where a lawyer asks Jesus what the greatest command is. And Jesus says, love God, love neighbor, love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and, well, all your heart, soul, and mind. Um, and then Jesus says, this is the greatest commandment. And then he adds, the second greatest commandment is to love your neighbors yourself. And he says that on these two commandments, all the law and the prophets hang. I think this is important context for Matthew 5 because it shows the centrality of love in Jesus' ethic, which is, of course, I think what Matthew 5, 43 to 48 is, is implying as well, the importance of love in Jesus' ethic. Um, love in this passage in Matthew 22 is the central concept behind the Old Testament scriptures because the law and the prophets is a shorthand for the Old Testament. Um, these were the first two main sections of the Old Testament. I'm bringing in some historical knowledge that you wouldn't necessarily know or bring in here, um, uh, but I, I, I sinned a little and brought in a little historical knowledge. Um, I, I guess I'm not entirely from Mars, but um, uh, clearly I would, I would assume that the law, the centrality of love uh, is clear for the, for the law. And therefore, um, this is important context, literary context. Uh, and I think I would say then that the verses that we're looking at in Matthew 5 give important information on the scope of this love command. Okay, I thought of another 
aspect of the rest of Matthew. By the way, since we're just starting, I don't expect you to know Matthew, for example, as thoroughly as I do. And I'm not saying that I am a, a thoroughly knowledge of Matthew, but I have a little bit of knowledge of Matthew. I've read Matthew before. Um, uh, and so like if you're doing an Isaiah passage, I don't expect you to know the rest of Isaiah. And the rest of Isaiah may not even be relevant you know, to Isaiah 7 if you're doing that particular assignment. But um, such as I have give I thee, I think Matthew 22 is important context. Now let me add another part of the broader literary context. Okay, I added another paragraph. And, you know, you, you could say is this is the so Matthew five is in the Sermon on the Mount, which is Matthew five through seven. And you could say is that part of the broader literary context or is that part of the immediate literary context? I'm going to treat it as part of the broader literary context because I'm going to just focus in on the last part of Matthew 5 when I get to immediate literary context. But here I've added a paragraph on Matthew 7.12. There's teaching the rest of the Sermon on the Mount that is relevant to these verses. Matthew 7.12 gives us another summary. Sorry, not summer. It is getting summer. Got summer on the brain. Another summary of the law and the prophets. Whatever you want that people would do to you, do thus also to them. This is the law and the prophets. This is the golden rule. And you can see that there's a parallel. Jesus says that loving your neighbor sums up the law and the golden rule sums up your law, there, sums up the law. Therefore, I, I would say the golden rule is a apt description of what Jesus means by loving others. And this plays out in Matthew 5, 43 to 48, right? Because what is Jesus doing? He is giving good things, sun, rain, to good and bad people. And so loving, some people make, well, love is by definition whatever God does, you know. And so if God wants to fry a bunch of people, then that's loving. Well, that's a nice theological argument, but it doesn't fly. Why? Because the word love had a meaning in Greek. And so if God, if God was saying something like I just said, he wouldn't have used the Greek word love because that's just not what the Greek word love means. The meaning of words is the way people use them. And the way people use the word love uh, at the time of, of Christ in Greek certainly wasn't about, if I go blow everybody up, that's love by definition. No, that's not the definition of the word love in Greek. It doesn't work. And in fact, here, Jesus uses language to describe what love is. Love wants the benefit of others. So frying people, if, unless that's somehow in their benefit, it's not loving. <laughs> and so what, is, what does it mean to love your neighbor? It means to, to do to them what you would have them do to you, to try to benefit them, to try to give something positive uh, to them. So here is an example of what we might do in laying out the broader literary context of something. And this, I think, applies whether, uh, whether you're writing the long form, commentary form, verse by verse with the descriptions, or whether you're using this um, um, kind of tabled form that I'm, I'm doing here. Okay, so that's the broader literary context. Now, let's look at the immediate literary context. And for the immediate literary context, I'm gonna focus on Matthew 5, 17 to 42. That is the verses that come right before um, uh, the key paragraph that we're looking at today. Now I've sinned again. In this paragraph, I've gone probably a little bit too far into, inter into interpretation, um, but I think this is important, uh, Jesus teaching uh, and stuff that the church is not doing very good at right now, possibly. Um, but the, the last paragraph, I believe, is a generalization of the rest of, of the chapter. You've heard not, so, and the key, this idea of not just loving your neighbor, but loving your enemy as well, I think is key to, because a lot of times people view the, you've heard, but I say to you as Jesus going deeper. You know, Jesus is even more legalistic, interestingly enough, because that's not what Jesus is doing at all, in my opinion. Jesus is changing the way you look at fulfilling the law. It's not just about you keep the law, you know, or you'll get fried. It's, it's ap applying this love lens um, to the law. So you've heard not to murder, but if you love your enemy, you won't even ponder it. You won't even dream about, oh, it wouldn't be nice if he fell on a, you know, a fence spike, you know, or something. That's kind of grody or gross. Anyway, you, you've heard not to commit adultery, but if you love your enemy, uh, you won't even fantasize about it. 
and, and you won't divorce your spouse to do it legally. You've heard not to, you've heard to keep your oaths, but if you love your enemy, you'll be a trustworthy person, you know, even to people who aren't particularly friendly to you. You won't need to take an oath. And you've heard an eye for an eye or tooth for tooth. Jesus reverses this one. He says, don't, don't do it. I know it's in the Old Testament. I know that Deuteronomy says, show no pity, an eye for an eye or tooth for tooth. Jesus says, nope. The person who loves their enemy will not insist on revenge. Indeed, in some cases, they may submit themselves to maltreatment. You know, if they compel you to go one mile, go two. If they slap you on the one cheek, give them the other, and, and so forth. Th these are hard words, but hey, it's Jesus. So this is the immediate context leading up to Matthew 5, 43 to 48. I want to go back to Matthew 5, 17 through 20 because it kicks off this section of the chapter. So let me add another paragraph here. So I don't think I read this third paragraph I just added, man, this is a video, this is a monster video to make uh, and lots of interruptions in, in work and life. But I believe I, I don't believe I've, so I'm sorry if I'm repeating myself, I don't remember, but I don't think I've read this uh, paragraph. So Matthew 5, 17 through 20, I think is, it's not only the lead off for all of these you've heard, but I say statements, but I think it's a general statement that plays itself out in the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. Um, and I'll use this probably as an example next week when we talk about surveying. Um, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, I'm sorry, but um, I'm gonna get, get it in while I have the chance. This paragraph, some, some interpret it, and I, I think I grew up hearing it, it's like, I've not only come to, to uh, continue the laws of the Old Testament, but I'm gonna make it even harder. I'm gonna go in even further. You know, I'm gonna make sure you trim the edges of your beard. You know, no goatees, no mustaches. Um, but I don't think when we, we reflect on, Jesus shows us what the fulfillment of the law and the prophets looks like in the rest of chapter five. And you'll notice that, for example, the law of retribution, he doesn't say, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to fry you if you don't get that eye, you know, an eye for an eye and tooth for tooth, or I'm going to make sure you keep your vow even harder than before. That's not what Jesus says. And so Jesus shows us, I think, in the rest of Matthew 5, that what it means to fulfill the law is not to go even harder. And it doesn't retain all of the Old Testament laws. It shuffles them. It reorients them. Uh, it takes the love principle and it says, okay, if the underlying principle is to love your enemy, then what does the law look like? And some things get intensified, like it's not just murder, it's not even dreaming of killing people, it's not just adultery, but it's not fantasizing ab about it. But it gets shuffled. It's, it's eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, we're not gonna do that. We're not gonna do it. It's, an old it's in the Old Testament but a fulfilled keeping of that law doesn't do it. What about the third commandment? Do not take the name of the Lord in vain. A fulfilled understanding of that doesn't even take oaths in the first place. So you see, it's not, it, it could be misleading when you read that paragraph, 17 through 20, to think that Jesus is going harder. That's not what he does. He reorients it around the principle of loving your neighbor and your enemy uh, as yourself. Okay. All of these things that we've been doing here is filling in what's called literary context. We're trying to understand. So instead of just quoting Matthew 5, 45, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. You can't really understand that verse for sure without the context. And this context in the rest of Matthew 5 and in the rest of the gospel of Matthew points us in a very clear direction. By the way, let me rag on John Wesley. John Wesley, I think, was wrong, uh, probably, in, in relating Matthew 5, 48 to, to Christian perfection as he thought of it. Yes, it does have to do with love. But the context, I think, is not really that ambiguous. The context is about being complete. And we'll probably use that word as an example uh, when we do a word study uh, a little bit later on in, in this class. Okay, so now let's go ahead and take the research we did earlier, and let's fill in some of the details. So let's start with the first verse, which is not the first verse, but it's verse 43. 
So let's start with 543, and let me show you how to fill in this chart. Okay, I took my sheets and I wrote down, I wrote down the verse, I gave my own translation, uh, and then I, uh, you don't have to do that, uh, and then I wrote down the observations of verse one that I had written on my, on my worksheets, right? I've written it out. And so I, I put them in, you know, keywords, grammatical issues, um, connecting words and thought uh, relationships, and then miscellaneous items. Okay, there you have it. Now we come to quite, by the way, I could have put one of these in each box. Maybe I'll, it depends on how the questions work. Um, I may actually, I, I could spread these out into boxes to where I have, I have one observation for box. I could do that, maybe I will, probably not. Uh, I just don't feel like it for whatever reason, but there's more than one way to skin a cat. Not that I've ever done that, but um, there's more than one way to present it. And like I said, you could do this in commentary form where you list the verse and then you have paragraphs where you, where you play these out. That would be another way uh, to do it. Now, I didn't have time to do it in our live session. If, if you watch the YouTube video on following a train of thought, I talk about it. And if you read the chapter I've written, uh, I talk about it. But we, let's say there are four basic kinds of questions. The first kind of question is a question of definition. And that's, that really applies to like, like keywords. So let, me, let me write out a question of definition on these, just a very simple one on these words. There, what is the meaning of these words? What does love mean? What, and that's setting me up for interpretation later on. I know that I'm gonna to wanna to do a word study on some of these words, maybe, if I wanna have a full understanding of this, this passage. So one kind of question are questions of definition. Two other kinds of questions are how and why questions. Um, so let me, let me see if I can come up with some of those for these other observations. Questions about the observations. So I added a couple questions here. The U is plural. Well, why is the U plural? Why is it not singular? How, how would the two differ? What would be the difference between it being a singular U or a plural U? Now we're not gonna answer these yet. Again, we're, we're gonna, we may approach them later on in interpretation. This is an observation exercise. I'm trying to figure out, um, I'm trying to to see what's what's there. Uh, uh, so there are definition questions, there are how questions, there are why questions. Another question is a question of implication. Let me write an implication question here. So there, what would be the implication of the plural instead of the singular? So four basic, I want you to ask questions about your observations, um, questions of definition, questions of why, questions of how, and then questions of implications. Now, not implications for today. This is important. Implications for today, that's application. That's way down the road in this course. It's an eight week, week course. We're not gonna talk about implications for today. I'm talking about the implications for what it meant originally here, because we're, we're not even to interpretation yet. We're just trying to plow the field. We're just trying to observe things and, and ask, well, what, how might this affect the meaning meaning okay let me let me do this with the third one uh, as well so I wrote a few down you know uh, what is the significance of the past tense of heard uh, I think there is a significance that it has to do with the contrast but um, with the next verse uh, is hate really a command these are really definition questions or what like what uh, is hate really a command you've heard it said hate your neighbor is that really in the Old Testament it's, it's not, um, not, not in the command form. Um, where does that come from? Where does the command to love come from? Here, I, 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 I suddenly realized I missed one of the miscellaneous features, and that's the intertextuality with Leviticus, which says, love your neighbors yourself. It is actually interacting with the Old Testament uh, here. That's where they've heard it. They've heard the love your neighbor part in the Old Testament. They've not heard the hate your enemy part, uh, at least not as a command in the Old Testament. Um, but um, so you, you don't have to be restricted by a, a straitjacket of definition in a kind of what does a word mean. There are, there are other kinds of questions you can ask, like, is hate really a command? Where did that come from? And, and those, those kinds of, of questions. So that brings us with number six. So why I've added a why question, a how question, and an implication question to number six. Why is Jesus giving his point of view? How does his point of view differ from that of others? 
what are the implications that his view is different uh, or, the, or if it is. Okay, so this gives you some sense of how you would go about, go about doing this. Um, now I don't wanna, I think I wanna bring this video to, to an end. Um, you can turn it in like this if you want, or you can write it up in paragraph form as well. Um, let me let me see if if there's so. Um, I've given you the four basic questions here. Okay, I went out and and filled verse two. But I say to you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. So my observation is that the connecting word but suggests a contrast with the quote in five forty three in the previous verse. Jesus' perspective, in other words, is different from what they have heard. I might add, uh, I didn't put it, but um, that um, it's a present tense, right? Jesus tells them to do that in the present tense. There, I went ahead and, and put out, you know, the, the contrast in tense is part of that as well. well I'm going to stop there. You know, if I were to continue, I would do 540. 5, 546, 547, 548, I would take my observations, I would transfer them to the central column, and then I would raise these questions in the final column, questions of definition, what, uh, who, what, where, when, and then I would ask why questions, how questions, and questions of implications. If you want to just turn in this sheet um, as your uh, detailed observation, that's fine. If you want to write it up in commentary form, that's that's fine as well. So this has been a sample of detailed observation.